All right, guys, Adam Trigger here, Wager Talk, back with another college basketball preview, and I've brought back Jim Root from Three Man Weave, special guest. Um, Jim, tell us about the burner. Tell us about what Three Man Weave's doing this year. Everyone should know you guys by now, but you have a new home, and I think it's fantastic. So tell the people what they can uh, expect from you guys this year. Yeah, we've, we've kind of been vagabonds with our, our college basketball previews, trying to find the right home for them. But this year, we are doing them within the Burner Discord, which is run by the anonymous man himself, Trilly Donovan, super connected, a lot of recruiting sources there for him. And that's part of the benefit of being in the Discord. He'll, he'll let you know on some recruiting intel early. But more importantly for us, you get all 364 of our written previews within there. there there's a website associated with it called BurnerExclusives.com. Get all the previews on there. We, we've got detailed write-ups about every single team, looking at some statistical analyses for each team, some roster notes on them. How are they going to look this upcoming season compared to maybe last year, compared to the consensus outlook for them? So definitely recommend checking out those write-ups. A lot of other good stuff within the Burner Discord, too. It is definitely worth the $6 a month you pay. Uh, you can log in for one month, read all our previews, and then cancel if you want to. I don't think you will once you get in there. But uh, it's worth checking out, I think, for all college basketball fans. It's a great place to hang out, talk ball with some other like-minded individuals, and and get a lot of information at the same time. Yeah, it's outstanding. Highly recommend it. it you know, for, for what it cost. I, I, I said this when Kai came on. I don't know how you're, like, handicapping college basketball in 2024 w without that. Like, it, it's a no-brainer to me. And I look forward to seeing what the Discord becomes because I think it could be pretty cool. Um you know, it, it's it's something I'll I intend to use all season. I've read all your previews, the ones that are out so far. And um, today we're talking about the Dayton Flyers, Jim. I uh, got a call from Kai a couple days before this game, a, a Dayton game last year. He's like, Trig, do you want to drive out to Dayton? Go to this uh, go. I think we saw St. Bonaventure Dayton uh, with me and Jim. I said, absolutely. I hopped in my car, made the eight hour drive out to Dayton. It was awesome. And I'm glad I did because what a season for Dayton, um, you know, at large bid to the NCAA tournament, uh, unreal comeback to beat Nevada, you know, generational talent for the program in Duran Holmes. And they hung with Arizona in the field, you know, in the, in the round of 62. So I'm glad I got to see that Dayton team in person. And Jim, you, you know, bef you were probably the first, person that I can remember talking about Holmes as like the legend that he became after the run that Dayton went on last season. So like, let's just start there. Talk about what Dayton loses now that Holmes is no longer on the team. Yeah, boy, he was really good. Uh, he did almost everything for them offensively, defensively, just so impactful as, as a player, you know, offensively, they could spread the ball out or spread the court, run a lot of pick and roll with him. Uh, they, they were heavy, heavy pick and roll last year with all the ball handlers they had. Or they could just plop him on the block, throw it down into him and say, you're either going to score one on one or they're going to double and he can uh, survey the floor, pass over the top. He's a really good passer for a guy his size and, and his skill level. He could find open shooters. They had all kinds of them. So it just made Dayton really, really hard to guard in the half court. And then defensively, he's a monster shot blocker who's mobile, uh, he, he'd be out guarding a guy on the on the perimeter, and he would just see a drive happening before it did, sag off his guy, get into the paint, and, and either affect the shot or outright block it altogether, which really amped up the defense for a team that basically played one big. Uh, Nate Santos was a really good floor stretching four. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about him coming back this year, but Holmes did a lot of the cleaning up inside, and, and they the replacement for him, Zed Key out of the portal, is not the same kind of player. He's not a pro like Deron Holmes. He's not a first-round pick in the NBA draft. So Dayton's going to have to retool and reshuffle a little bit without their big man. I, I do not think, Trig, that this is a, a Ewing theory situation where the team will improve without him. He, he was just too good. I think they're going to have to try to you know, readjust and, and reshuffle what they're doing. Yeah, it's, it's funny you bring that up because uh, I've actually been like uh, against – I've been anti-Ewing theory in, in college basketball – like, the, you know, I, I guess going into this season, reason being, I think the game has gotten a little bit dumbed down from what it used to be based on, you know, just out of necessity, right? Like there's so much roster turnover and stuff relative to like, let's say 10 years ago that 
coaches have to keep things a little bit more simple. You, you just, you know, especially when you're at the bigger schools and you're not going to get the, you know, you're just not going to have guys in, in a lot of cases for four years in the same team and so on and so forth that when a team does lose a guy like Holmes, I almost think it's like more impactful than, than maybe the, the market like kind of suggests. Like I, I look at this and Key's a fine player, so on and so forth. I don't think there's any chance he replaces Holmes, and I instantly downgraded Dayton because of that. Yeah, I, I've been maybe a little bit lower on Dayton than my three man weave cohorts, Matt and Kai, this off season. You know, I think there's there's an upside scenario where they're back in that at, at large conversation, but yeah, it's just not the same team without Holmes. Every other guy has to rise into a bigger spot, a bigger role, get a little bit more defensive attention. There's more going into him on the. Uh, the opponent's scouting report, they, they can focus on them a little bit more. That's going to be tougher offensively, and that's really where they kind of made their hay last year. They were tough to stop, especially in the half court, and they slowed teams down and played that way. Now, defensively, that's that's in a, maybe an even bigger question, too, with Key not having the same mobility as Holmes. Yeah, I, I think the Flyers are going to take a slight step back this year, but uh, we'll see how they all come together. There's pieces here. There's stuff to, to potentially make it work for Anthony Grant, but Without Holmes, there's not that one kind of combining, binding force that makes them you know, really just a, a difficult team to prepare for and play against. Uh, I agree. Now, one of those pieces, kind of a, almost like a bonus player at this point, is Malachi Smith because, you know, of course, he played, what, 10 minutes last year before getting hurt and, and we was not to be heard from again the rest of the season. Uh, you go back to the, the prior year had injury issues like pretty much right out of the gate. Um, I remember being out in Vegas at Dayton UNLV and he kind of like, you know, got scratched like right before that game and maybe only played like 12, 13 games all season. But I mean, you go back to his rookie or his freshman year, it was really, really good. So the, you know, what do you expect out of him? I mean, is he going to be fully healthy? Can they, can they, can they count on him to be uh, Malachi Smith of two years ago? Or is that like a massive question mark here? It, it feels like a pretty big question mark. Um, just kind of reading some of the reports out of Dayton. I don't think he was fully healthy through all the off-season workouts. I think it was a torn ACL in November, like, like you mentioned when you were at four. And that can be you know, nine to 12 months. For some guys, it is a full year and even a little bit longer before they're confident in it. Um, so hopefully he's back to what he was. And it, it's easy to forget, but you know his, his freshman year, he and Holmes were this you know, tag team duo in the same freshman class. Like, oh man, Dayton's going to build around these guys for years to come. And then unfortunately he gets his career thwarted by injuries uh, two years in a row, really, where he just was kind of first a shell of himself and then barely got to play. So I hope they get the, the ultimate version of Malachi Smith, the floor general that can shoot it from deep and just has terrific passing vision and timing and is able to get to his spots on the court and set others up. Thankfully, uh, I, I think Grant did a great job of finding alternatives here. And you know, they had one last year in, in Javon Bennett, who's back. And they dipped into the portal for another potential point guard piece. But I, I think the best version of this team is Malachi Smith is the guy running it. Maybe it's not right away. Maybe it's not in November where he looks like himself. But perhaps it's like you know, Zakai Ziegler last year. It took about 10 games to really get his feet under him. And suddenly he was that all-conference star that, that we've all come to see. So hopefully Malachi Smith can get to that point ramped up as they get into league play and and become that star that he looked like back in his freshman season. Yeah, I, I think what what concerns me too as I, I kind of look at this team and knowing the way Dayton plays, kind of the you know la, uh, the way they played last year, kind of you know playing around Holmes, four other guards like surrounding them, shooting a ton of threes. Um, I I don't know that. Well, two things. One. Is Key going to get the same kind of respect for that to work like that? Or, you know, whoever else they can kind of put down there, whether it be Isaac Jack, I think, you know, Jacob Connor has some size, comes in for Marshall. And two, are the guards going to, like, is Posh Alexander going to be able to shoot it like you would need to to take that volume of threes? Because there was a point in time where Dayton was hitting threes at a, like, a top five clip, right? I think if you go back to right around the time we went to that Dayton Bonnie's game, I think they were like fifth in the country in, in three point field goal percentage and remained up there, you know, for most of the year. So again, those are kind of concerns for me. Uh, but at the same time, are, are they better defensively? Can they make up for that somewhere else? Or is this just not the same Dayton team? 
Yeah, he, defensively, uh, adding Posh Alexander is is huge. He's a terrific ball pressure guard. He lives in the shorts of his his matchup. He can go 94 feet with the guy. He, he's really well built for a lead guard, so you can't just kind of shrug him off. He, he can hound you and chest you, and then he pokes it away, and suddenly he's going the other way with your cookies and laying it in. So that's something they added that I don't think they really had last year, but without the shot blocking of Holmes, they're not as covered on the back end. The, the two through four spots aren't as stout as maybe Pasha Alexander is on the ball. So I have some questions defensively too, and, and I think Holmes is really good in giving them options and ball screens. He could switch if he had to. He could play at the level of the screen, or he could be a great drop big. Now you kind of have to play drop with Key. If he's out stretched out in the perimeter, trying to shuffle with guards, I think that's when they start to get beat. They get put in rotation. And defenses, or, or excuse me, uh, opponents can really take advantage of getting them shuffled around that way. I think that was always something that hurt Ohio State when Zed Key was there. Their defenses were not good when he anchored them, and it was partially because he had to be near the uh, near the, near the bucket, and he also isn't a great shot blocker. So it's it kind of give and take. I, I think Key will still be a weapon in the paint, not quite to the extent that that Holmes was, but he's always been a good individual scorer, one on one inside. He's got good touch. He'll play through the chest of his opponent. He can score. He can finish through contact. But, yeah, man, it, it's just not quite the same makeup, and it's going to put more stress on Alexander creating from the perimeter and Nate Santos to continue hitting incredible amounts of threes. They don't have Kobe Brea as that 50% completely unlock the floor, high-volume shooter guy. Like They have to kind of figure out how these new pieces fit into the roles because I don't think they're going to be able to clone last year's style despite having, you know, Key being the uh, like-for-like like almost replacement with, with Holmes up front. Yeah, I mean, what, what uh, another thing that interests me here, you know, last year to this year is, like, Dayton last year was, was really almost like bordering on elite defensively. You know, I, I go back to the game that we attended together because I think it was, like, such a good example of, of Dayton basketball. I remember sitting there. I had St. Bonaventure plus seven and a half in that game. And, and there was a point in time where it looked like the Bonnies were going to get run out of the gym. And, and essentially what Dayton did was, or what, what St. Bonaventure had to do, was just start firing transition threes, taking threes in transition, because there was just no chance they were getting to the rim uh, against Dayton. And you talked about Holmes, his ability to block shots. Like, that's what I'm concerned with when it comes to this team, is, is you look at this roster, and it feels to me like they either need to, they're either going to be more defensive and lack some of the shooting, or they're going to have some of the guards in that can really shoot and, and maybe like lose a bit, little bit defensively. But at the same time, they're going to lose just not having homes. So uh, I guess it's like mostly concerns for me when it comes to this Dayton team. I'm not saying they can't, you know, blast the lower half of the A10, but I, I have some serious concerns when you when you talk about playing like some of the better opposition here. Yeah, they've, they've got to kind of figure out their role player situation. Like, is Enoch Cheeks going to find the shooting stroke that he really had more at Robert Morris and, and sort of lost last year? They need that wing scorer. And you look down the bench, they're super high on Hamad Musa, the Qatari freshman that's coming in. He's a 6'8", really lanky, kind of skinny, but he can shoot the lights out. Apparently, he's looked good all summer. They're excited to get him probably as a sixth man, but you could see him challenging for a starting spot later in the year if he really does live up to some of that potential. Uh, Marvell Allen has been dealing with injuries he missed all last year. He was a, a top 150 recruit that, that hopefully can get healthy and be a presence on the wing. And you mentioned Connor earlier from Marshall. He, he's a very strange player. He played some point guard at Marshall despite being 6'9", mm -hmm. 6'10". He likes to handle the ball. He's not your true kind of post. So perhaps they can be a little bit more unconventional with the personnel that they have, a 6'8 shooter in Moose, a 6'9 ball handler in, in Connor, a bulldog point guard in, in Posh. Like They don't maybe fit the exact type of you know, like archetypes of players that you think of with basketball, but you can weaponize that. You, you can be a little tougher to play against and prepare for because you're like, all right, maybe this team doesn't center around one NBA star in Holmes. But there are some weird things we don't see very often on the other side of the court, and opponents are going to have a trouble, a little bit of trouble figuring out how to solve some of the mysteries that Dayton could put out. Now, it's that's that's the best case scenario for all those guys and all of them translating into the A10 immediately. But 
there's at least some bites at the apple there on the bench with what Grant has acquired that I, I think there's chances they can really develop the rotation and not have to play as thin of a bench as they played last year. I mean, they were 345th in bench minutes for Ken Palm. They, they didn't have as much options on the bench as they might this year. Yeah, I think Anthony Grant's going to have to earn really earn his paycheck this year because when I look at this roster, I just don't see like an optimal lineup for them. I see a lot of good players, a lot of good pieces, but you know, I, I not not the optimal lineup that like you would. I guess that that Dayton kind of always had on the floor last year. Which brings me to like the betting outlook portion, although we've kind of like intertwined it with this whole thing. For me, you know, it. it I'm going to be interested, Jim, how the market like uh, prices this Dayton team. What I'm hoping for is that they get priced similarly to like what they did last year, or just like not necessarily last year, but like they're still pretty good. There's pretty good name recognition for Dayton when it comes to like an A10 type team, where I think that they're almost always going to get respect for the name on the front of the jersey, because I will probably look to play against them. You talk about their schedule. Um, now they have an easy schedule, like all things considered, they do not play a true road game until January 4th, 2025. So that's nice. A lot of those games at UD arena, which shout out to UD arena. I had a blast there with you guys. And that place is awesome. Highly recommend checking out UD arena if you're in the area, but I'm looking at the schedule, St. Francis, PA, Northwestern, Ball State, New Mexico State, Western Michigan, Lehigh, and then they end up getting a little bit tougher with Marquette and UNLV, but all home games, uh, which is which is favorable to them. Where Dayton could get in trouble, Jim, they're in the Maui. They're heading out to Hawaii, Maui Invitational. There's some big boys out there, and they're going to have to play three of them over the course of like three days. Um, do you see them being at like a, a big disadvantage in that Maui tournament? Yeah, yeah, I do. I, I'm concerned about them with Maui. And now that that Northwestern game, I think, is going to be fun to start the year, or at least the first Friday. The one mm-hmm. I look for there is is the under. I, I think Dayton's going to be still trying to figure out their offensive approach. Northwestern loses Boo Booey, the you know most important player in program history there. And as you mentioned uh, in our other episode about VCU, Dayton can get in some rock fights. They they can play some ugly games, some half court drag out fights, and, and Northwestern is no stranger to those either. So that's one I'd be looking at now. Out out on the island, yeah, I, I I'm concerned for for Dayton. It is a loaded field this year. North Carolina, Iowa State, Auburn, uh, Memphis, UConn. That, that's a tough, tough group. And the, the schedule is not super kind to, to Dayton here. North Carolina in the first round and then the other side or, or on that same side, Auburn, Iowa State. It's basically three top 15 teams. We don't have the AP poll quite yet, but I expect all three to be in that top 15. And Dayton is, is not on that level right now, unfortunately. So they could be looking at that difficult 0-2 and, and maybe hoping they get Colorado in that, that consolation matchup because you yeah. do not want to leave the Islands 0-3. That's that's a tough look for both Dayton and, and for the A-10, just trying to build at-large cases. You want to win all those games you can against non-conference opponents and, and build up that leverage so that once you get into A-10 play, knocking somebody else off actually counts as a Q1 win or a Q2 win, uh, and it starts in the non-conference. Yeah, the Northwestern game is interesting. I'll be curious to see what like the number is in that game because there's no question like there's going to be opportunities to take big numbers uh, against Dayton this year when they're at home. They get a lot of respect at home and, and probably rightfully so for for what a home court advantage they've had over the years, but you know, you look at pre-Maui, it's there, there's four games pre-Maui um that are, you know, you know, Ball State maybe like New Mexico State, we'll, we'll have to see how I, I feel about them. But when, when they come back, the opponents at home get a little bit tougher. Even like a, a Lehigh, a Western Michigan, probably getting good numbers with them. A UNLV, Marquette is certainly obviously like a, a formidable opponent. So, yeah, I, I guess in, in conclusion, kind of a team I'm, I'm looking to fade just because I think the market still might be high on the name on the front of the jersey. Yeah, and if, if they're landing you know, right where the, right now they're 70th at Bart Torvik, we don't have Ken Palm out, obviously, too proxies for the market roughly i'm similar ish to where bart's got them at 70th that's kind of the the range i'm going to start them in but to your point i I do think they could end up getting priced a little higher than that their home court's been awesome for years and years we saw why firsthand but i I, I just i'm not ready to to believe in that offense blowing teams out and that's there were a couple years before last year when they were an elite shooting team that the offense just wasn't good enough to to win games by 2025 consistently 
I'm not sure it's going to be this year. So it, it'll be something I'm looking to, to step on as well. And you mentioned coming back from the island, tough opponents. Just coming all the way back from, from uh, Maui can be tough for teams. A uh, little bit of a jet lag or you, know, you played three huge games. Now you're playing a bye game against Western Michigan. It's tough to get up for. I think that schedule mm-hmm. spot sets up well and that uh, Western Michigan and Lehigh on the schedule before they get Marquette. I think those could be two really good spots to fade Dayton. Yeah, now those are and and they're, they're teams. I think I I'm willing to like you know play you know go to go to battle with um, you know just having as a big dog. So yeah, I've kind of got those circled as well. Um, but yeah, it'll be interesting to see. Yeah, I think Maui could could give them trouble too. And sometimes in that Maui tournament, Jim, like the books, I think maybe price it a little bit lazy. It's like neutral floor. It's typically like all big names, and and sometimes you get like minus threes and stuff like that when it probably should be like a six or seven point spread. So something to keep an eye on there as well. All right, Jim Root, thanks for joining me. Um, This was the Dayton preview. Check out our VCU preview, which is up with all of the team specific previews over on the wager talk YouTube channel. Our video team did a fantastic job putting them all together this year in a playlist. So you can play them one after another. We'll have 30 by the time we're all said and done. uh, And we're tipping off on November 4th. Uh, but go over to BurnerExclusive.com. BurnerExclusive.com, Jim? Did I get that right? Yep. BurnerExclusive.com is the site. You'll need a key from within the Discord. Uh, but again, that's $6 a month. You get your key from there, and you can read to your heart's content uh, the thousands and thousands of words we've written on our previews there. Yeah, I was going to say, I've got 30 team previews based on teams that I went and saw in person last year. they got all 364 teams, and it's very easy to easy to read through awesome reference tool it will help you well into the season like the previews i think i've referenced your guys previews you know all the way right up to tournament time you know the last you know five six seven years however long you've been doing it so great stuff there um and and then like and subscribe to our to our youtube channel give me a follow on all the platforms at adam trigger wt this was the dayton preview we'll see you guys again tomorrow for another college basketball preview tip off november 4th talk to you guys soon